Chapter 1 The Period It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There were a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state preserves of loaves and fishes that things in general were settled for ever. It was the year of our Lord, 1775. Spiritual revelations were conceded to England at that favoured period as at this. Mrs. Southcott had recently attained her five-and-twentieth blessed birthday, of whom a prophetic private in the lifeguards had heralded the sublime appearance by announcing that arrangements were made for the swallowing up of London and Westminster. Even the Cock Lane ghost had been laid only a round dozen of years after wrapping out its messages as the spirits of this very year last past, supernaturally deficient in originality, wrapped out theirs. Mere messages in the earthly order of events had lately come to the English crown and people from a congress of British subjects in America, which, strange to relate, have proved more important to the human race than any communications yet received through any of the chickens of the Cock Lane brood. France, less favoured on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness downhill, making paper money and spending it. Under the guidance of her Christian pastors, she entertained herself besides with such humane achievements as sentencing a youth to have his hands cut off, his tongue torn out with pincers, and his body burned alive because he had not kneeled down in the rain to do honour to a dirty procession of monks which passed within his view at a distance of some fifty or sixty yards. It is likely enough that rooted in the woods of France and Norway there were growing trees when that sufferer was put to death already marked by the woodman fate to come down and be sawn into boards to make a certain movable framework with a sack and a knife in it terrible in history. It is likely enough that in the rough outhouses of some tillers of the heavy lands adjacent to Paris there were sheltered from the weather that very day rude carts, bespattered with rustic mire, snuffed about by pigs and roosted in by poultry, which the farmer death had already set apart to be his tumbrils of the revolution. But that woodman and that farmer, though they work unceasingly, work silently, and no one heard them as they went about with muffled tread the rather for as much as to entertain any suspicion that they were awake, was to be atheistical and traitorous. In England there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. Families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture to upholsterers' warehouses for security. The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light, and, being recognised and challenged by his fellow tradesman, whom he stopped in his character of the captain, gallantly shot him through the head and rode away. The mail was waylaid by seven robbers, and the guard shot three dead, and then got shot dead himself by the other four, in consequence of the failure of his ammunition, after which the mail was robbed in peace. That magnificent potentate, the Lord Mayor of London, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman who despoiled the illustrious creature in sight of all his retinue. Prisoners in London jails fought battles with their turnkeys, and the majesty of the law fired blunderbusses in among them, loaded with rounds of shot and ball. Thieves snipped off diamond crosses from the necks of noble lords at court drawing-rooms. 
Musketeers went into St. Giles's to search for contraband goods, and the mob fired on the musketeers, and the musketeers fired on the mob, and nobody thought any of these occurrences much out of the common way. In the midst of them, the hangman, ever busy and ever worse than useless, was in constant requisition, now stringing up long rows of miscellaneous criminals, now hanging a housebreaker on Saturday who had been taken on Tuesday, now burning people in the hand at Newgate by the dozen, and now burning pamphlets at the door of Westminster Hall, today taking the life of an atrocious murderer, and tomorrow of a wretched pilferer who had robbed a farmer's boy of sixpence. All these things, and a thousand like them, came to pass in and close upon the dear old year 1,775. Environed by them, while the woodman and the farmer worked unheeded, those two of the large jaws, and those other two of the plain and the fair faces, trod with stir enough, and carried their divine rights with a high hand. Thus did the year 1,775 conduct their greatnesses, and myriads of small creatures, the creatures of this chronicle among the rest, along the roads that lay before them. Chapter 2 The Mail it was the Dover Road that lay on a Friday night late in November before the first of the persons with whom this history has business. The Dover Road lay, as to him, beyond the Dover Mail, as it lumbered up Shooter's Hill. He walked uphill in the mire by the side of the mail, as the rest of the passengers did, not because they had the least relish for walking exercise under the circumstances, but because the hill and the harness and the mud and the mail were all so heavy that the horses had three times already come to a stop, besides once drawing the coach across the road with the mutinous intent of taking it back to Blackheath. Reins and whip and coachman and guard, however, in combination, had read that article of war which forbade a purpose otherwise strongly in favour of the argument that some brute animals are endued with reason, and the team had capitulated and returned to their duty. With drooping heads and tremulous tails, they mashed their way through the thick mud, floundering and stumbling between whiles as if they were falling to pieces at the larger joints. As often as the driver rested them and brought them to a stand with a wary, "Woho, ho show-ho, then, the near leader violently shook his head and everything upon it, like an unusually emphatic horse, denying that the coach could be got up the hill. Whenever the leader made this rattle, the passenger started, as a nervous passenger might, and was disturbed in mind. There was a steaming mist in all the hollows, and it had roamed in its forlornness up the hill like an evil spirit, seeking rest and finding none. A clammy and intensely cold mist, it made its slow way through the air in ripples that visibly followed and overspread one another, as the waves of an unwholesome sea might do. It was dense enough to shut out everything from the light of the coach lamps, but these its own workings and a few yards of road and the reek of the labouring horses steamed into it, as if they had made it all. Two other passengers, besides the one, were plodding up the hill by the side of the mail. All three were wrapped to the cheekbones and over the ears, and wore jackboots. Not one of the three could have said from anything he saw what either of the other two was like, and each was hidden under almost as many wrappers from the eyes of the mind as from the eyes of the body of his two companions. In those days, travellers were very shy of being confidential on a short notice, for anybody on the road might be a robber or in league with robbers. As to the latter, when every posting-house and alehouse could produce somebody in the captain's pay, ranging from the landlord to the lowest stable nondescript, it was the likeliest thing upon the cards. So the guard of the Dover Mail thought to himself, that Friday night in November, 1,775, lumbering up Shooter's Hill, as he stood on his own particular perch behind the mail, beating his feet, and keeping an eye and a hand on the arm-chest before him, where a loaded blunderbuss lay at the top of six or eight loaded horse-pistols, deposited on a substratum of cutlass. 
The Dover Mail was in its usual genial position that the guard suspected the passengers, the passengers suspected one another and the guard, they all suspected everybody else, and the coachman was sure of nothing but the horses. As to which cattle, he could with a clear conscience have taken his oath on the two testaments that they were not fit for the journey. Whoa, ho! said the coachman. So then, one more pull and you're at the top and be damned to you, for I've had trouble enough to get you to it. Joe? Hello? the guard replied. What o'clock do you make it, Joe? Ten minutes, good. Past eleven. My blood! ejaculated the vexed coachman. And not a top of shooters yet! Tch! Yeah! Get on with you! The emphatic horse, cut short by the whip in a most decided negative, made a decided scramble for it, and the three other horses followed suit. Once more, the Dover Mail struggled on, with the jackboots of its passengers squashing along by its side. They had stopped when the coach stopped, and they kept close company with it. If any one of the three had had the hardihood to propose to another to walk on a little ahead into the mist and darkness, he would have put himself in a fair way of getting shot instantly as a highwayman. The last burst carried the mail to the summit of the hill. The horses stopped to breathe again, and the guard got down to skid the wheel for the descent and opened the coach door to let the passengers in. Tchah! Joe! cried the coachman in a warning voice, looking down from his box. What do you say, Tom? They both listened. I say a horse at a canter coming up, Joe. I say a horse at a gallop, Tom, returned the guard, leaving his hold of the door and mounting nimbly to his place. Gentlemen, in the king's name, all of you. With this hurried adjuration, he cocked his blunderbuss and stood on the offensive. The passenger, booked by this history, was on the coach step getting in. The two other passengers were close behind him and about to follow. He remained on the step, half in the coach and half out of it. They remained in the road below him. They all looked from the coachman to the guard and from the guard to the coachman and listened. The coachman looked back and the guard looked back, and even the emphatic leader pricked up his ears and looked back without contradicting. The stillness consequent on the cessation of the rumbling and labouring of the coach added to the stillness of the night made it very quiet indeed. The panting of the horses communicated a tremulous motion to the coach, as if it were in a state of agitation. The hearts of the passengers beat loud enough, perhaps, to be heard. But at any rate, the quiet pause was audibly expressive of people out of breath and holding the breath, and having the pulses quickened by expectation. The sound of a horse at a gallop came fast and furiously up the hill. So ho! the guard sang out as loud as he could roar. Yo there! Stand, I shall fire! The pace was suddenly checked, and with much splashing and floundering, a man's voice called from the mist. Is that the Dover Mail? Never you mind what it is, the guard retorted. What are you? Is that the Dover Mail? Why do you want to know? I want a passenger if it is. What passenger? Mr. Jarvis Lorry. Our booked passenger showed in a moment that it was his name. The guard, the coachman, and the two other passengers eyed him distrustfully. Keep where you are, the guard called to the voice in the mist, because if I should make a mistake, it could never be set right in your lifetime. Gentlemen of the name of Lorry, answer straight. What is the matter? asked the passenger then, with mildly quavering speech. Who wants me? Is it Jerry? I don't like Jerry's voice if it is Jerry, growled the guard to himself. He's hoarser than suits me, is Jerry. Yes, Mr. Lorry. What is the matter? A dispatch sent you from over yonder, T and Co. I know this messenger, God, said Mr. Lorry, getting down into the road, assisted from behind more swiftly than politely by the other two passengers, who immediately scrambled into the coach, shut the door, and pulled up the window. He may come close. There's nothing wrong. I hope there ain't, but I can't make so nation sure of that, said the guard in gruff soliloquy. Hello, you. Well, and hello, you said Jerry. Come on at a foot pace, do you mind me? And if you've got holsters to that saddle of yawn, don't let me see your hand go nigh em, for I'm a devil at a quick mistake, and when I make one, it takes the form of lead. So now let's look at you. The figures of a horse and rider came slowly through the eddying mist, and came to the side of the mail where the passenger stood. 
The rider stooped, and, casting up his eyes at the guard, handed the passenger a small folded paper. The rider's horse was blown, and both horse and rider were covered with mud, from the hoofs of the horse to the hat of the man. Guard, said the passenger, in a tone of quiet business confidence. The watchful guard, with his right hand at the stock of his raised blunderbuss, his left at the barrel, and his eye on the horseman, answered curtly, Sir, there is nothing to apprehend. I belong to Telson's Bank. You must know Telson's Bank in London. I am going to Paris on business. A crown to drink. I may read this? If so be, sir, quick, sir. He opened it in the light of the coach lamp on that side, and read, first to himself, and then aloud, Wait at Dover for Mamselle. It's not long, you see, God. Jerry, say that my answer was, Recalled to life. Jerry started in his saddle. Well, that's a blazing strange answer, too, said he, at his horsest. Take that message back, and they will know that I received this as well as if I wrote. Make the best of your way. Good night. With those words, the passenger opened the coach door and got in, not at all assisted by his fellow passengers, who had expeditiously secreted their watches and purses in their boots, and were now making a general pretense of being asleep, with no more definite purpose than to escape the hazard of originating any other kind of action. The coach lumbered on again, with heavier wreaths of mist closing round it as it began the descent. The guard soon replaced his blunderbuss in his arm-chest, and, having looked to the rest of its contents and having looked to the supplementary pistols that he wore in his belt, looked to a smaller chest beneath his seat, in which there were a few smith's tools, a couple of torches, and a tinder-box. For he was furnished with that completeness that if the coach-lamps had been blown and stormed out, which did occasionally happen, he had only to shut himself up inside, keep the flint and steel sparks well off the straw, and get a light with tolerable safety and ease, if he were lucky, in five minutes. Tom, softly over the coach roof, Hello, Joe. Did you hear the message? I did, Joe. What did you make of it, Tom? Nothing at all, Joe. That's a coincidence, too, the guard mused, for I made the same of it myself. Jerry, left alone in the mist and darkness, dismounted, meanwhile, not only to ease his spent horse, but to wipe the mud from his face and shake the wet out of his hat-brim, which might be capable of holding about half a gallon. After standing with the bridle over his heavily splashed arm until the wheels of the mail were no longer within hearing and the night was quite still again, he turned to walk down the hill. After that there gallop from Temple Bar, old lady, I won't trust your forelegs till I get you on the level, said this horse messenger, glancing at his mare. Recalled to life. That's a blazing strange message. Much of that wouldn't do for you, Jerry. I say, Jerry, you'd be in a blazing bad way if recalling to life was to come into fashion, Jerry. Chapter 3 The Night Shadows A wonderful fact to reflect upon, that every human creature is constituted to be that profound secret and mystery to every other. A solemn consideration, when I enter a great city by night, that every one of those darkly clustered houses encloses its own secret, that every room in every one of them encloses its own secret that every beating heart in the hundreds of thousands of breasts there is, in some of its imaginings, a secret to the heart nearest it. Something of the awfulness, even of death itself, is referable to this. No more can I turn the leaves of this dear book that I loved, and vainly hope in time to read it all. No more can I look into the depths of this unfathomable water, wherein, as momentary lights glanced into it, I have had glimpses of buried treasure and other things submerged. It was appointed that the book should shut with a spring for ever and for ever when I had read but a page. It was appointed that the water should be locked in an eternal frost when the light was playing on its surface, and I stood in ignorance on the shore. My friend is dead. My neighbour is dead. My love, the darling of my soul, is dead. 
It is the inexorable consolidation and perpetuation of the secret that was always in that individuality, and which I shall carry in mine to my life's end. In any of the burial places of this city through which I pass, is there a sleeper more inscrutable than its busy inhabitants are in their innermost personality to me, or than I am to them? As to this, his natural and not to be alienated inheritance, the messenger on horseback had exactly the same possessions as the king, the first minister of state, or the richest merchant in London. So, with the three passengers shut up in the narrow compass of one lumbering old mail coach, they were mysteries to one another, as complete as if each had been in his own coach and six, or his own coach and sixty, with the breadth of a county between him and the next. The messenger rode back at an easy trot, stopping pretty often at alehouses, by the way, to drink, but evincing a tendency to keep his own counsel, and to keep his hat cocked over his eyes. He had eyes that assorted very well with that decoration, being of a surface black, with no depth in the colour or form, and much too near together, as if they were afraid of being found out in something, singly, if they kept too far apart. They had a sinister expression, under an old cocked hat like a three-cornered spittoon, and over a great muffler for the chin and throat, which descended nearly to the wearer's knees. When he stopped for drink, he moved this muffler with his left hand only while he poured his liquor in with his right. As soon as that was done, he muffled again. "'No, Jerry, no,' said the messenger, harping on one theme as he rose. "'It wouldn't do for you, Jerry. Jerry, you honest tradesman, it wouldn't suit your line of business. Recalled. Bust me if I don't think he'd been a-drinking.' His message perplexed his mind to that degree that he was fain several times to take off his hat to scratch his head. Except on the crown, which was raggedly bald, he had stiff black hair standing jaggedly all over it, and growing downhill almost to his broad, blunt nose. It was so like Smith's work, so much more like the top of a strongly spiked wall than a head of hair, that the best of players at Leapfrog might have declined him as the most dangerous man in the world. To go over. While he trotted back with the message he was to deliver to the night watchman in his box at the door of Telson's Bank by Temple Bar, who was to deliver it to greater authorities within, the shadows of the night took such shapes to him as arose out of the message, and took such shapes to the mare as arose out of her private topics of uneasiness. They seemed to be numerous, for she shied at every shadow on the road. What time the mail-coach lumbered, jolted, rattled, and bumped upon its tedious way, with its three fellow inscrutables inside, to whom, likewise, the shadows of the night revealed themselves in the forms their dozing eyes and wandering thoughts suggested. Telson's bank had a run upon it in the mail. As the bank passenger, with an arm drawn through the leathern strap, which did what lay in it to keep him from pounding against the next passenger and driving him into his corner whenever the coach got a special jolt, nodded in his place, with half-shut eyes, the little coach windows and the coach lamp dimly gleaming through them, and the bulky bundle of opposite passenger became the bank, and did a great stroke of business. The rattle of the harness was the chink of money, and more drafts were honoured in five minutes than even Telson's, with all its foreign and home connection, ever paid in thrice the time. Then the strong rooms underground at Telson's, with such of their valuable stores and secrets as were known to the passenger, and it was not a little that he knew about them, opened before him, and he went in among them with the great keys and the feebly burning candle, and found them safe and strong and sound and still, just as he had last seen them. But though the bank was almost always with him, and though the coach, in a confused way, like the presence of pain under an opiate, was always with him, there was another current of impression that never ceased to run all through the night. He was on his way to dig someone out of a grave. Now which of the multitude of faces that showed themselves before him was the true face of the buried person, the shadows of the night did not indicate. 
but they were all the faces of a man of five and forty by years, and they differed principally in the passions they expressed, and in the ghastliness of their worn and wasted state. Pride, contempt, defiance, stubbornness, submission, lamentation succeeded one another. So did varieties of sunken cheek, cadaverous colour, emaciated hands and figures. But the face was, in the main, one face, and every head was prematurely white. A hundred times the dozing passenger inquired of this spectre, Buried how long? The answer was always the same. Almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out? Long ago. You know that you are recalled to life? They tell me so. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Shall I show her to you? Will you come and see her? The answers to this question were various and contradictory. Sometimes the broken reply was, Wait, it would kill me if I saw her too soon. Sometimes it was given in a tender rain of tears, and then it was, Take me to her. Sometimes it was staring and bewildered, and then it was, I don't know her. I don't understand. After such imaginary discourse, the passenger, in his fancy, would dig and dig, dig, now with a spade, now with a great key, now with his hands, to dig this wretched creature out. Got out at last, with earth hanging about his face and hair, he would suddenly fall away to dust. The passenger would then start to himself and lower the window to get the reality of mist and rain on his cheek. Yet even when his eyes were opened on the mist and rain, on the moving patch of light from the lamps and the hedge at the roadside retreating by jerks, the night shadows outside the coach would fall into the train of the night shadows within. The real banking house by Temple Bar, the real business of the past day, the real strong rooms, the real express sent after him, and the real message returned would all be there. Out of the midst of them, the ghostly face would rise, and he would accost it again. Buried how long? Almost eighteen years. I hope you care to live. I can't say. Dig, 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 until an impatient movement from one of the two passengers would admonish him to pull up the window, draw his arm securely through the leathern strap, and speculate upon the two slumbering forms until his mind lost its hold of them and they again slid away into the bank and the grave. Buried how long? Almost eighteen years. You had abandoned all hope of being dug out long ago. The words were still in his hearing as just spoken, distinctly in his hearing as ever spoken words had been in his life, when the weary passenger started to the consciousness of daylight and found that the shadows of the night were gone. He lowered the window and looked out at the rising sun. There was a ridge of ploughed land with a plough upon it where it had been left last night when the horses were unyoked. Beyond, a quiet coppice wood in which many leaves of burning red and golden yellow still remained upon the trees. Though the earth was cold and wet, the sky was clear and the sun rose bright, placid and beautiful. Eighteen years said the passenger, looking at the sun. Gracious creator of day, to be buried alive for eighteen years. Chapter 4 The Preparation When the mail got successfully to Dover in the course of the forenoon, the head drawer at the Royal George Hotel opened the coach door as his custom was. He did it with some flourish of ceremony, for a mail journey from London in winter was an achievement to congratulate an adventurous traveller upon. By that time there was only one adventurous traveller left to be congratulated, for the two others had been set down at their respective roadside destinations. 
The mildewy inside of the coach, with its damp and dirty straw, its disagreeable smell, and its obscurity, was rather like a larger dog kennel. Mr. Lorry, the passenger, shaking himself out of it in chains of straw, a tangle of shaggy wrapper, flapping hat, and muddy legs, was rather like a larger sort of dog. "'There will be a packet to Calais tomorrow, draw?' "'Yes, sir. If the weather holds and the wind sets tolerable fair, the tide will serve pretty nicely at about two in the afternoon, sir. "'Bed, sir? I shall not go to bed till night, but I want a bedroom and a barber. "'And then breakfast, sir?' Yes, sir. That way, sir, if you please. Show Concord, gentlemen's valise and hot water to Concord. Pull off gentlemen's boots in Concord. You will find a fine sea coal fire, sir. Fetch barber to Concord. Stir about there now for Concord. The Concord bedchamber being always assigned to a passenger by the mail, and passengers by the mail being always heavily wrapped up from head to foot, the room had the odd interest for the establishment of the Royal George, that although but one kind of man was seen to go into it, all kinds and varieties of men came out of it. Consequently, another drawer, and two porters, and several maids, and the landlady, were all loitering by accident at various points of the road between the Concord and the coffee-room, when a gentleman of sixty, formally dressed in a brown suit of clothes, pretty well worn but very well kept, with large square cuffs and large flaps to the pockets, passed along on his way to his breakfast. The coffee-room had no other occupant that forenoon than the gentleman in brown. His breakfast-table was drawn before the fire, and as he sat with its light shining on him, waiting for the meal, he sat so still that he might have been sitting for his portrait. Very orderly and methodical he looked, with a hand on each knee, and a loud watch ticking a sonorous sermon under his flapped waistcoat, as though it pitted its gravity and longevity against the levity and evanescence of the brisk fire. He had a good leg, and was a little vain of it, for his brown stockings fitted sleek and close, and were of a fine texture. His shoes and buckles, too, though plain, were trim. He wore an odd little sleek crisp flaxen wig, setting very close to his head, which wig, it is to be presumed, was made of hair, but which looked far more as though it were spun from filaments of silk, or glass. His linen, though not of a fineness in accordance with his stockings, was as white as the tops of the waves that broke upon the neighbouring beach, or the specks of sail that glinted in the sunlight far at sea. A face, habitually suppressed and quieted, was still lighted up under the quaint wig by a pair of moist, bright eyes that it must have cost their owner, in years gone by, some pains to drill to the composed and reserved expression of Telson's bank. He had a healthy colour in his cheeks, and his face, though lined, bore few traces of anxiety. But perhaps the confidential bachelor clerks in Telson's bank were principally occupied with the cares of other people, and perhaps second-hand cares, like second-hand clothes, come easily off and on. Completing his resemblance to a man who was sitting for his portrait, Mr. Lorry dropped off to sleep. The arrival of his breakfast roused him, and he said to the drawer, as he moved his chair to it, "'I wish accommodation prepared for a young lady who may come here at any time today. "'She may ask for Mr. Jarvis Lorry, "'or she may only ask for a gentleman from Telson's Bank. "'Please to let me know. "'Yes, sir. "'Telson's Bank in London, sir?' "'Yes. "'Yes, sir. "'We have oftentimes the honour to entertain your gentlemen "'in their travelling backwards and forwards betwixt London and Paris, sir. "'A vast deal of travelling, sir, in Telson and Company's house. "'Yes.' "'We are quite a French house, as well as an English one. "'Yes, sir. "'Not much in the habit of such travelling yourself, I think, sir. "'Not of late years. "'It is fifteen years since we... "'since I came last from France. "'Indeed, sir. "'That was before my time here, sir. "'Before our people's time here, sir. "'The George was in other hands at that time, sir. "'I believe so. But I would hold a pretty wager, sir, that a house like Telson and Company was flourishing a matter of fifty, not to speak of fifteen years ago. You might treble that and say a hundred and fifty, yet not be far from the truth. Indeed, sir. Rounding his mouth and both his eyes, as he stepped backward from the table, the waiter shifted his napkin from his right arm to his left, dropped into a comfortable attitude, 
and stood surveying the guest while he ate and drank, as from an observatory or watchtower, according to the immemorial usage of waiters in all ages. When Mr. Lorry had finished his breakfast, he went out for a stroll on the beach. The little, narrow, crooked town of Dover hid itself away from the beach and ran its head into the chalk cliffs like a marine ostrich. The beach was a desert of heaps of sea and stones tumbling wildly about, and the sea did what it liked, and what it liked was destruction. It thundered at the town and thundered at the cliffs and brought the coast down madly. The air among the houses was of so strong a piscatory flavour that one might have supposed sick fish went up to be dipped in it as sick people went down to be dipped in the sea. A little fishing was done in the port and a quantity of strolling about by night and looking seaward, particularly at those times when the tide made and was near flood. Small tradesmen who did no business whatever sometimes unaccountably realised large fortunes, and it was remarkable that nobody in the neighbourhood could endure a lamplighter. As the day declined into the afternoon, and the air, which had been at intervals clear enough to allow the French coast to be seen, became again charged with mist and vapour, Mr. Lorry's thoughts seemed to cloud too. When it was dark and he sat before the coffee-room fire, awaiting his dinner, as he had awaited his breakfast, his mind was busily digging, digging, digging in the live red coals. A bottle of good claret after dinner does a digger in the red coals no harm, otherwise than as it has a tendency to throw him out of work. Mr. Lorry had been idle a long time and had just poured out his last glassful of wine with as complete an appearance of satisfaction as is ever to be found in an elderly gentleman of a fresh complexion who has got to the end of a bottle, when a rattling of wheels came up the narrow street and rumbled into the inn-yard. He set down his glass, untouched. "'This is Mademoiselle,' said he. In a very few minutes the waiter came into to announce that Miss Manette had arrived from London and would be happy to see the gentleman from Telson's. So soon? Miss Manette had taken some refreshment on the road and required none then, and was extremely anxious to see the gentleman from Telson's immediately, if it suited his pleasure and convenience. The gentleman from Telson's had nothing left for it but to empty his glass with an air of stolid desperation, settle his odd little flaxen wig at the ears, and follow the waiter to Miss Manette's apartment. It was a large, dark room, furnished in a funereal manner with black horsehair, and loaded with heavy, dark tables. These had been oiled and oiled, until the two tall candles on the table in the middle of the room were gloomily reflected on every leaf, as if they were buried in deep graves of black mahogany, and no light to speak of could be expected from them, until they were dug out. The obscurity was so difficult to penetrate that Mr. Lorry, picking his way over the well-worn Turkey carpet, supposed Miss Manette to be for the moment in some adjacent room, until, having got past the two tall candles, he saw, standing to receive him by the table between them and the fire, a young lady of not more than seventeen, in a riding cloak, and still holding her straw travelling hat by its ribbon in her hand. As his eyes rested on a short, slight, pretty figure, a quantity of golden hair, a pair of blue eyes that met his own with an inquiring look, and a forehead with a singular capacity, remembering how young and smooth it was, of lifting and knitting itself into an expression that was not quite one of perplexity, or wonder, or alarm, or merely of a bright fixed attention, though it included all the four expressions, as his eyes rested on these things, a sudden vivid likeness passed before him of a child whom he had held in his arms on the passage across that very channel one cold time when the hail drifted heavily and the sea ran high. The likeness passed away, say, like a breath along the surface of the gaunt pier-glass behind her, on the frame of which a hospital procession of negro cupids, several headless and all cripples, were offering black baskets of dead sea fruit to black divinities of the feminine gender. And he made his formal bow to Miss Manette. "'Pray take a seat, sir.' 
in a very clear and pleasant young voice, a little foreign in its accent, but a very little indeed. "'I kiss your hand, miss,' said Mr. Lorry, with the manners of an earlier date, as he made his formal bow again, and took his seat. "'I received a letter from the bank, sir, yesterday, informing me that some intelligence or discovery... "'The word is not material, miss. Either word will do. "'Respecting the small property of my poor father, whom I never saw, so long dead.' Mr. Lorry moved in his chair and cast a troubled look towards the hospital procession of negro cupids, as if they had any help for anybody in their absurd baskets. Rendered it necessary that I should go to Paris, there to communicate with a gentleman of the bank, so good as to be dispatched to Paris for the purpose. Myself. As I was prepared to hear, sir. She curtsied to him. Young ladies made curtsies in those days, with a pretty desire to convey to him that she felt how much older and wiser he was than she. He made her another bow. I replied to the bank, sir, that, as it was considered necessary by those who know, and who are so kind as to advise me, that I should go to France, and that as I am an orphan, and have no friend who could go with me, I should esteem it highly if I might be permitted to place myself during the journey under that worthy gentleman's protection. The gentleman had left London, but I think a messenger was sent after him to beg the favour of his waiting for me here. I was happy, said Mr. Lorry, to be entrusted with the charge. I shall be more happy to execute it. Sir, I thank you indeed. I thank you very gratefully. It was told me by the bank that the gentleman would explain to me the details of the business, and that I must prepare myself to find them of a surprising nature. I have done my best to prepare myself, and I naturally have a strong and eager interest to know what they are. Naturally, said Mr. Lorry. Yes, I... After a pause, he added, again settling the crisp flaxen wig at the ears, It is very difficult to begin. He did not begin, but in his indecision met her glance. The young forehead lifted itself into that singular expression, but it was pretty and characteristic besides being singular, and she raised her hand as if with an involuntary action she caught at or stayed some passing shadow. Are you quite a stranger to me, sir? Am I not? Mr. Lorry opened his hands and extended them outwards with an argumentative smile. Between the eyebrows and just over the little feminine nose, the line of which was as delicate and fine as it was possible to be, the expression deepened itself as she took her seat thoughtfully in the chair by which she had hitherto remained standing. He watched her as she mused, and the moment she raised her eyes again, went on, "'In your adopted country, I presume... I cannot do better than address you as a young English lady, Miss Manette. If you please, sir. Miss Manette, I am a man of business. I have a business charge to acquit myself of. In your reception of it, don't heed me any more than if I was a speaking machine. Truly, I am not much else. I will, with your leave, relate to you, Miss, the story of one of our customers. Story? He seemed willfully to mistake the word she had repeated, when he added in a hurry, Yes, customers. In the banking business we usually call our connection our customers. He was a French gentleman, a scientific gentleman, a man of great acquirements, a doctor. Not of Beauvais? Why, yes, of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of Beauvais. Like Monsieur Manette, your father, the gentleman was of repute in Paris. I had the honour of knowing him there. Our relations were business relations, but confidential. I was, at that time, in our French house, and had been, oh, twenty years. At that time? I may ask at what time, sir? I speak, miss, of twenty years ago. He married an English lady, and I was one of the trustees. His affairs, like the affairs of many other French gentlemen and French families, were entirely in Telson's hands. 
In a similar way, I am or I have been trustee of one kind or other for scores of our customers. These are mere business relations, miss. There is no friendship in them, no particular interest, nothing like sentiment. I have passed from one to another in the course of my business life, just as I pass from one of our customers to another in the course of my business day. In short, I have no feelings. I am a mere machine. To go on... But this is my father's story, sir, and I begin to think... The curiously roughened forehead was very intent upon him. That when I was left an orphan through my mother's surviving my father only two years... It was you who brought me to England. I am almost sure it was you. Mr. Lorry took the hesitating little hand that confidingly advanced to take his, and he put it with some ceremony to his lips. He then conducted the young lady straightway to her chair again, and holding the chair back with his left hand, and using his right by turns to rub his chin, pull his wig at the ears, or point what he said, stood looking down into her face, while she sat looking up into his. Miss Manette, it was I. And you will see how truly I spoke of myself just now in saying I had no feelings, and that all the relations I hold with my fellow creatures are mere business relations, when you reflect that I have never seen you since. No, you have been the ward of Telson's house since, and I have been busy with the other business of Telson's house since. Feelings. I have no time for them, no chance of them. I pass my whole life, miss, in turning an immense pecuniary mangle. After this odd description of his daily routine of employment, Mr. Lorry flattened his flaxen wig upon his head with both hands, which was most unnecessary, for nothing could be flatter than its shining surface was before, and resumed his former attitude. So far, miss, as you have remarked, this is the story of your regretted father. Now comes the difference. If your father had not died when he did... Don't be frightened. How you start? She did indeed start, and she caught his wrist with both her hands. Pray, said Mr. Lorry in a soothing tone, bringing his left hand from the back of the chair to lay it on the supplicatory fingers that clasped him in so violent a tremble. Pray control your agitation. A matter of business... As I was saying, her look so discomposed him that he stopped, wandered, and began anew. As I was saying, if Monsieur Manette had not died, if he had suddenly and silently disappeared, if he had been spirited away, if it had not been difficult to guess to what dreadful place, though no art could trace him, if he had an enemy in some compatriot who could exercise a privilege that I, in my own time, have known the boldest people afraid to speak of in a whisper across the water there, for instance, the privilege of filling up blank forms for the consignment of any one to the oblivion of a prison for any length of time, if his wife had implored the king, the queen, the court, the clergy for any tidings of him, and all quite in vain, then the history of your father would have been the history of this unfortunate gentleman, the doctor of Beauvais. I entreat you to tell me more, sir. I will. I am going to. You can bear it? I can bear anything but the uncertainty you leave me in at this moment. You speak collectedly, and you are collected. That's good though his manner was less satisfied than his words. A matter of business. Regard it as a matter of business, business that must be done. Now, if this doctor's wife, though a lady of great courage and spirit, had suffered so intensely from this cause before her little child was born... The little child was a daughter, sir? A daughter. A uh, uh, matter of business. Don't be distressed. Miss... If the poor lady had suffered so intensely before her little child was born that she came to the determination of sparing the poor child the inheritance of any part of the agony she had known the pains of by rearing her in the belief that her father was dead, no, don't kneel. In heaven's name, why should you kneel to me? 
for the truth. Oh, dear, good, compassionate sir, for the truth. Uh, a matter of business. You confuse me. And how can I transact business if I'm confused? Let us be clear-headed. If you could kindly mention now, for instance, what nine times ninepence are, or how many shillings in twenty guineas, it would be so encouraging. I should be so much more at my ease about your state of mind. Without directly answering to this appeal, she sat so still when he had very gently raised her, and the hands that had not ceased to clasp his wrists were so much more steady than they had been, that she communicated some reassurance to Mr. Jarvis Lorry. That's right. That's right. Courage. Business. You have business before you. Useful business. Miss Manette, your mother took this course with you, and when she died, I believe broken-hearted, having never slackened her unavailing search for your father, she left you at two years old to grow to be blooming, beautiful, and happy, without the dark cloud upon you of living in uncertainty whether your father soon wore his heart out in prison or wasted there through many lingering years. As he said the words, he looked down with an admiring pity on the flowing golden hair, as if he pictured to himself that it might have been already tinged with grey. You know that your parents had no great possession, and that what they had was secured to your mother and to you. There has been no new discovery of money or of any other property, but... He felt his wrist held closer, and he stopped. The expression in the forehead, which had so particularly attracted his notice, and which was now immovable, had deepened into one of pain and horror. But he has been... been found. He is alive. Greatly changed, it is too probable. Almost a wreck, it is possible. Though we will hope the best. Still alive. Your father has been taken to the house of an old servant in Paris, and we are going there. I to identify him if I can, you to restore him to life, love, duty, rest, comfort. A shiver ran through her frame, and from it through his. She said in a low, distinct, awe-stricken voice, as if she was saying it in a dream, I am going to see his ghost. It will be his ghost, not him. Mr. Lorry quietly chafed the hands that held his arm. There, there, there. See now, see now. You are well on your way to the poor wronged gentleman, and with a fair sea voyage and a fair land journey, you will be soon at his dear side. She repeated in the same tone, sunk to a whisper, I have been free, I have been happy, yet his ghost has never haunted me. Only one thing more, said Mr. Lorry, laying stress upon it as a wholesome means of enforcing her attention. He has been found under another name, his own long forgotten or long concealed. It would be worse than useless now to inquire which, worse than useless to seek to know whether he has been for years overlooked or always designedly held prisoner. It would be worse than useless now to make any inquiries, because it would be dangerous. Better not to mention the subject anywhere or in any way, and to remove him, for a while at all events, out of France. Even I, safe as an Englishman, and even Telson's, important as they are to French credit, avoid all naming of the matter. I carry about me not a scrap of writing openly referring to it. This is a secret service altogether. My credentials, entries, and memoranda are all comprehended in the one line, recalled to life, which may mean anything. But what is the matter? She doesn't notice a word. Miss Manette! Perfectly still and silent, and not even fallen back in her chair, she sat under his hand utterly insensible, with her eyes open and fixed upon him, and with that last expression looking as if it were carved or branded into her forehead. So close was her hold upon his arm that he feared to detach himself, lest he should hurt her. Therefore he called out loudly for assistance without moving. 
a wild-looking woman, whom even in his agitation Mr. Lorry observed to be all of a red colour, and to have red hair, and to be dressed in some extraordinary tight-fitting fashion, and to have on her head a most wonderful bonnet like a grenadier wooden measure, and good measure too, or a great Stilton cheese, came running into the room in advance of the inn servants and soon settled the question of his detachment from the poor young lady by laying a brawny hand upon his chest and sending him flying back against the nearest wall. "'I really think this must be a man,' was Mr. Lorry's breathless reflection, simultaneously with his coming against the wall. "'Why, look at you all!' bawled this figure, addressing the inn servants. "'Why don't you go and fetch things, instead of standing there staring at me? I am not so much to look at, am I?' "'Why don't you go and fetch things? "'I'll let you know if you don't bring smelling salts, "'cold water and vinegar. Quick, I will.' "'There was an immediate dispersal for these restoratives, "'and she softly laid the patient on a sofa "'and tended her with great skill and gentleness, "'calling her my precious and my bird, "'and spreading her golden hair aside over her shoulders "'with great pride and care. "'And you in brown!' she said indignantly, turning to Mr. Lorry. "'Couldn't you tell her what you had to tell her without frightening her to death? Look at her with her pretty pale face and her cold hands. Do you call that being a banker?' Mr. Lorry was so exceedingly disconcerted by a question so hard to answer that he could only look on at a distance, with much feebler sympathy and humility, while the strong woman, having banished the inn-servants, under the mysterious penalty of letting them know something not mentioned if they stayed there staring, recovered her charge by a regular series of gradations, and coaxed her to lay her drooping head upon her shoulder. "'I hope she will do well now,' said Mr. Lorry. "'No thanks to you in brown if she does, my darling pretty.' "'I hope,' said Mr. Lorry, after another pause of feeble sympathy and humility, "'that you accompany Miss Manette to France.' "'A likely thing, too,' replied the strong woman." If it was ever intended that I should go across salt water, do you suppose Providence would have cast my lot in an island? This being another question hard to answer, Mr. Jarvis Lorry withdrew to consider it. Chapter 5 The Wine Shop A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of a cart. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine shop, shattered like a walnut shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business or their idleness to run to the spot and drink the wine. The rough, irregular stones of the street pointing every way, and designed, one might have thought, expressly to lame all living creatures that approached them, had dammed it into little pools. These were surrounded, each by its own jostling group or crowd, according to its size. Some men kneeled down, made scoops of their two hands joined, and sipped, or tried to help women who bent over their shoulders to sip, before the wine had all run out between their fingers. Others, men and women, dipped in the puddles with little mugs of mutilated earthenware, or even with handkerchiefs from women's heads, which were squeezed dry into infants' mouths. Others made small mud embankments to stem the wine as it ran. Others, directed by lookers-on up at high windows, darted here and there to cut off little streams of wine that started away in new directions. Others devoted themselves to the sodden and lee-dyed pieces of the cask, licking and even champing the moister wine-rotted fragments with eager relish. There was no drainage to carry off the wine, and not only did it all get taken up, but so much mud got taken up along with it that there might have been a scavenger in the street, if anybody acquainted with it could have believed in such a miraculous presence. A shrill sound of laughter and of amused voices, voices of men, women and children, resounded in the street while this wine game lasted. There was little roughness in the sport and much playfulness. There was a special companionship in it, an observable inclination on the part of everyone to join some other one, which led, especially among the luckier or lighter-hearted, to frolicsome embraces, drinking of healths, shaking of hands, and even joining of hands and dancing a dozen together. 
when the wine was gone, and the places where it had been most abundant were raked into a gridiron pattern by fingers, these demonstrations ceased as suddenly as they had broken out. The man who had left his saw sticking in the firewood he was cutting set it in motion again. The woman who had left on a doorstep the little pot of hot ashes at which she had been trying to soften the pain in her own starved fingers and toes or in those of her child returned to it. Men with bare arms, matted locks and cadaverous faces who had emerged into the winter light from cellars moved away to descend again and a gloom gathered on the scene that appeared more natural to it than sunshine. The wine was red wine and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of St. Antoine, in Paris, where it was spilled. It had stained many hands, too, and many faces, and many naked feet, and many wooden shoes. The hands of the man who sawed the wood left red marks on the billets, and the forehead of the woman who nursed her baby was stained with the stain of the old rag she wound about her head again. Those who had been greedy with the staves of the cask had acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth and one tall joker, so besmirched, his head more out of a long squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine lees. Blood. The time was to come when that wine, too, would be spilled on the street stones, and when the stain of it would be red upon many there. And now that the cloud settled on St. Antoine, which a momentary gleam had driven from his sacred countenance, the darkness of it was heavy. Cold, dirt, sickness, ignorance, and want were the lords in waiting on the saintly presence. Nobles of great power, all of them, but most especially the last. Samples of a people that had undergone a terrible grinding and re-grinding in the mill, and certainly not in the fabulous mill which ground old people young, shivered at every corner passed in and out at every doorway, looked from every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment that the wind shook. The mill which had worked them down was the mill that grinds young people old. The children had ancient faces and grave voices, and upon them and upon the grown faces and ploughed into every furrow of age and coming up afresh was the sign, hunger. It was prevalent everywhere. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses in the wretched clothing that hung upon poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and paper. Hunger was repeated in every fragment of the small modicum of firewood that the man sawed off. Hunger stared down from the smokeless chimneys and started up from the filthy street that had no offal among its refuse of anything to eat. Hunger was the inscription on the baker's shelves, written in every small loaf of his scanty stock of bad bread. At the sausage shop, in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. Hunger rattled its dry bones among the roasting chestnuts in the turned cylinder. Hunger was shred into atomies in every farthing porringer of husky chips of potato, fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Its abiding place was, in all things, fitted to it. A narrow winding street, full of offence and stench, with other narrow winding streets diverging, all peopled by rags and nightcaps, and all smelling of rags and nightcaps, and all visible things with a brooding look upon them that looked ill. In the hunted air of the people there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. Depressed and slinking though they were, eyes of fire were not wanting among them, nor compressed lips white with what they suppressed, nor foreheads knitted into the likeness of the gallows rope they mused about enduring or inflicting. The trade signs, and they were almost as many as the shops, were all grim illustrations of want. The butcher and the pork man painted up only the leanest scrags of meat, the baker the coarsest of meagre loaves. The people rudely pictured as drinking in the wine shops croaked over their scanty measures of thin wine and beer and were gloweringly confidential together. Nothing was represented in a flourishing condition save tools and weapons, but the cutler's knives and axes were sharp and bright, the smith's hammers were heavy, and the gunmaker's stock was murderous. 
The crippling stones of the pavement, with their many little reservoirs of mud and water, had no footways but broke off abruptly at the doors. The kennel, to make amends, ran down the middle of the street, when it ran at all, which was only after heavy rains, and then it ran by many eccentric fits into the houses. Across the streets, at wide intervals, one clumsy lamp was slung by a rope and pulley. At night, when the lamplighter had let these down and lighted and hoisted them again, a feeble grove of dim wicks swung in a sickly manner overhead, as if they were at sea. Indeed they were at sea, and the ship and crew were in peril of tempest. For the time was to come, when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamplighter in their idleness and hunger so long as to conceive the idea of improving on his method, and hauling up men by those ropes and pulleys to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain, for the birds, fine of song and feather, took no warning. The wine-shop was a corner-shop, better than most others in its appearance and degree, and the master of the wine-shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches, looking on at the struggle for the lost wine. "'It's not my affair,' said he, with a final shrug of the shoulders." The people from the market did it. Let them bring another. There, his eyes happening to catch the tall joker writing up his joke, he called to him across the way. Say then, my Gaspard, what do you do there? The fellow pointed to his joke with immense significance, as is often the way with his tribe. It missed its mark and completely failed, as is often the way with his tribe too. What now? Are you a subject for the mad hospital? said the wine shopkeeper, crossing the road and obliterating the jest with a handful of mud picked up for the purpose and smeared over it. Why do you write in the public streets? Is there, tell me thou, is there no other place to write such words in? In his expostulation, he dropped his cleaner hand, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, upon the joker's heart. The joker wrapped it with his own, took a nimble spring upward, and came down in a fantastic dancing attitude, with one of his stained shoes jerked off his foot into his hand and held out. A joker of an extremely, not to say wolfishly, practical character, he looked, under those circumstances. Put it on, put it on, said the other. Call wine, wine, and finish there. With that advice, he wiped his soiled hand upon the joker's dress, such as it was, quite deliberately, as having dirtied the hand on his account, and then recrossed the road and entered the wine-shop. This wine-shop keeper was a bull-necked, martial-looking man of thirty, and he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day he wore no coat, but carried one slung over his shoulder. His shirt-sleeves were rolled up, too, and his brown arms were bare to the elbows. Neither did he wear anything more on his head than his own crisply curling short dark hair. He was a dark man altogether, with good eyes and a good bold breadth between them. Good-humoured looking on the whole, but implacable looking too. Evidently a man of a strong resolution and a set purpose. A man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulf on either side, for nothing would turn the man. Madame Defarge, his wife, sat in the shop behind the counter as he came in. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age, with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything, a large hand heavily ringed, a steady face, strong features, and great composure of manner. There was a character about Madame Defarge from which one might have predicated that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided. Madame Defarge, being sensitive to cold, was wrapped in fur, and had a quantity of bright shawl twined about her head, though not to the concealment of her large earrings. Her knitting was before her, but she had laid it down to pick her teeth with a toothpick. Thus engaged, with her right elbow supported by her left hand, Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed, just one grain of cough. 
This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows over her toothpick by the breadth of a line, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look around the shop among the customers for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. The wine shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady who was seated in a corner. Other company were there, two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, "'This is our man.' "'What the devil do you do in that galley there?' said Monsieur Defarge to himself. "'I don't know you.' But he feigned not to notice the two strangers, and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. "'How goes it, Jacques?' said one of these three to Monsieur Dufage. "'Is all the spilt wine swallowed?' "'Every drop, Jacques,' answered Monsieur Dufage. When this interchange of Christian name was effected, Madame Dufage, picking her teeth with her toothpick, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. It is not often, said the second of the three, addressing Monsieur Dufage, that many of these miserable beasts know the taste of wine, or of anything but black bread and death. Is it not so, Jacques? It is so, Jacques, Monsieur Dufage returned. At this second interchange of the Christian name, Madame Dufage, still using her toothpick with profound composure, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. The last of the three now said his say, as he put down his empty drinking vessel and smacked his lips. Ah, so much the worse. A bitter taste it is that such poor cattle always have in their mouths and hard lives they live, Jacques. Am I right, Jacques? You are right, Jacques, was the response of Monsieur Defarge. This third interchange of the Christian name was completed at the moment when Madame Defarge put her toothpick by, kept her eyebrows up, and slightly rustled in her seat. "'Hold, then, true,' muttered her husband. "'Gentlemen, my wife.' The three customers pulled off their hats to Madame Defarge with three flourishes. She acknowledged their homage by bending her head and giving them a quick look. Then she glanced in a casual manner round the wine-shop, took up her knitting with great apparent calmness and repose of spirit, and became absorbed in it. "'Gentlemen,' said her husband, who had kept his bright eye observantly upon her. "'Good day. The chamber furnished bachelor fashion that you wished to see, and were inquiring for when I stepped out, is on the fifth floor. The doorway of the staircase gives on the little courtyard close to the left here,' pointing with his hand, near to the window of my establishment. "'But now that I remember, one of you has already been there, and can show the way. Gentlemen, adieu.' They paid for their wine, and left the place. The eyes of Monsieur Defarge were studying his wife at her knitting when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner and begged the favour of a word. "'Willingly, sir,' said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short but very decided. Almost at the first word Monsieur Defarge started and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady, and they too went out. Madame Dufage knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows, and saw nothing.